I want to introduce uh, Pat Ritz, who is our guest speaker today. I've known Pat forever. Actually, when I first came into the business, when I was in, at Fannie Mae in, in Philadelphia, and Pat's an experienced mortgage banking expert. He's been in the business for a long time on every which way. He ran his own mortgage banking firm. He was on the MI side. He really has done everything, and now he's moved to the other side of the business, and he's a real estate agent in Scottsdale, which obviously is a terrific place to be, and I'm jealous. Pat, say hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on today. Yes. Pat, I know since you've been on both sides, and I know everybody is talking, I certainly see it from my consulting business, is that this whole issue of what should a loan officer do to develop real estate agents, why don't you share kind of your experience of what you would recommend actually work since now you're on that side of the business? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Since I switched over to what I used to refer as the dark side, um, <laughs> Uh, one, one thing I did pay particular attention to was how it got, how it's structured. And I wound up uh, becoming an agent um, you know, to, to keep my head in the game and so forth. And one of the things you said earlier um, is to pay attention to new agents. And, and, and this is a, uh, an important element because, first of all, 80% of new agents wash out in the first year. And that's a combination of People think it's real simple. Uh, people don't realize how much money you have to invest in it to, to have a shot and how much effort you have to put into it. Um, one of the things, one of the first things I would suggest is to target a brokerage, an office, even a team within an office within a brokerage. Um, that's very critical. It, it, it fine tunes you down and enables you to find out who you think the players are going to be. Um, and, and as Pat said earlier, providing information, uh, you know, information emails, uh, sponsoring seminars that are open not just to necessarily one brokerage, but anybody in the real estate industry, and sponsoring uh, continuing ed classes. It's an opportunity for you to see who's interested and for you to get some visibility. Um, secondly, I would say stay persistent and stay consistent. You know, the, the shotgun approach just doesn't work anymore uh, for a lot of reasons. One, as Pat talked about earlier, we, aren't, we don't work in the office anymore. So, so that we're all around. And having your guy go in or the loan officer go in and gather a group just doesn't pan out. So what you have to do is, is pick the people you want to work with or that you're going to target, and you have to stay persistent and consistent. And like anything else in life, you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to hit a home run every time at bat. You're going to strike out a few times, you're going to hit some singles, and you just have to stay with it. So, Pat, when you look at it from your viewpoint and yeah. just kind of talking about, you know, how you linked up with uh, some loan officers, that, again, you're not from Scottsdale, so it wasn't as if you had prior relationships. So how did that work in your experience, and, how, and what worked with the originators, without naming names, that you ended up uh, doing business with? Yeah, and, that's, um, and, and that exactly is what I was talking about, that I, I saw who was providing services. And I, by services, and I'll talk about this a little later, I don't necessarily mean M MSAs. I mean, that gets you some visibility. But, you know, a, a good agent will, will keep his eyes and ears open for what someone is really providing because it is truly a partnership. It's much more of a partnership now than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, just because, as you said, uh, you know, the post-crash is much more complex. So what I did was paid attention to who was out there and what other agents said about them from experience. And experience meaning, you know, how did they perform when they got a deal. I wound up with uh, the vast majority of my business goes to a lender who is not a preferred lender of my brokerage, uh, did provide some ancillary services that helped me in the business. Uh, 
They have a, a website generator. So my GoDaddy website points to the website they provided. They have a tremendous reputation for if they say they're going to close the deal, they close the deal. And third, and far more importantly, they have a great reputation for communication, both with the agent and with the borrower. And that becomes critical. Uh, but, you know, the number one reason realtors fail is communication. And that works hand in hand with the lender because today it's more like I said it's more a partnership than ever before so, so you really pay attention to who out there has something to provide not ne not necessarily at the beginning a referral system because anybody who expects you're going to get referrals without effort is kidding themselves but instead somebody who has something to provide to help you in your business efforts so Pat I think it'd be interesting and certainly I think a lot of times originators may not really understand all the work you go through. I mean, originators, and certainly what I saw in the consulting that I see all the time, the originator is always saying, you know, if I, I could do business with someone for years, but if I make one mistake, it's over, and what type of partnership is that? Um, but I think sometimes a lot of what's kind of not understood is the work that you do to try to get a, 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 a buyer or a seller in place. Maybe you can kind of talk about what that looks like so the originators on the webinar today can understand how hard you have to work. Well, the single biggest thing is that there isn't a published market. You know, for, for an LO, there are real estate agents, and you, you know they're out there. For a real estate agent, it's the populace. So, I mean, yes, you might have a sphere of influence, people you know, relatives, family, friends. I happen to have none of that when I, when I came out here. So uh, I started from scratch. And what it is, is there is a lot of door knocking. There's a lot of telephone calling. Um, and I, by that, I mean cold calling. You know, getting a list of phone numbers in an area that you're going to farm, calling, 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 and it becomes a numbers game. Um, you know, when you talk about rejection, you have to be prepared to face, you know, an 80-plus percent rejection rate, either in door knocking or in telephone calling. Secondly is to get very comfortable with any presentation script or presentation you're going to make in either, either of those aspects. Thirdly, open houses, uh, a critical, for me, my number one way of getting business is open houses. For one, I've determined you have a viable uh, buyer opportunity there because somebody is looking, and the vast majority of people that are looking are not just out there because they have nothing to do on a Sunday. So it, it, with the right personality, and I, and I think uh, my age helps because I, I'm not a young whippersnapper, as some people might say. So uh, going out and sitting open houses. Now, that's, that's an effort. You know, every four-hour open house involves about 12 to 15 hours of prep. And, uh, you know, you can sit there. You can have people very interested and you show them, you help them, and then they go and do a deal with their cousin who does three deals a year. So it is, it is a, a, it's much more difficult getting a lead as a real estate agent than it was for me getting leads as a lender. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about, Pat, that you spend 12 to 15 hours prior to an open house, talk about what that's involved for you. Well, first of all, there's, there's finding what open house you want to do. You know, you, you're looking, uh, you have to pick an area that you're, that's, that you're farming. I mean, you don't want to start running an open house an hour and a half from your home. Um, you want someone, so you're going to look first of all, you're going to go through the MLS, you're going to find properties that geographically, price-wise, and condition-wise meet what you're looking to get for a target buyer or a target seller. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I don't do any open houses 
under $300,000. So first of all, there's finding that target market, then getting somebody to, to do that product. Then you're developing your flyers. Then you are, you are doing a combination of door knocking and calling. I will start on the Wednesday before an open house and call around in a, in a, a small area, usually within a block or two of the house of the, that I'm holding open. Then on the Friday before the open house, I'll go knock doors. Um, generally, 20 to 30 homes right in the immediate vicinity, the neighbors. And you're inviting the neighbors to come see. You know, it's an opportunity to see what your neighbor's house is like, and maybe you know somebody who wants to come into the area. In addition to that, then I start calling a wider area around the home I'm holding open. The reason I do the first calls on Wednesday is that when I door knock on Friday, they might recognize the name or remember the call, or at least I can reference it. Then, of course, you're, you're getting to the house, you're preparing the house for the open, you're setting up all of your information, you're putting out all your signs, you know, in, in advance you're looking where you're going to place your signs. And then after the open house, there's all the breaking down breaking down, putting the house back in order, going, collecting your signs. And it, it's, a, it's a bigger effort than you think. Uh, the natural thought process is, oh, you show up, you hold your house open, and you go home. And it, it's much more complicated than that to do it the right way. Right. Well, it's actually, it's interesting you say that. And for anybody who watches, you know, HGTV and, in particular, I see uh, flip and flop quite a bit, and they make it seem like they do it in 30 seconds. So you're exactly right, is that there's a lot more that goes to it. So once you have done that, has that been successful for you? That's obviously why you're doing it. Yes. For, for me, it is, it's the route I chose for my primary marketing effort. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being there are a gazillion people out there knocking on doors and cold calling. And I'm not saying I don't do some of that. I do probably five hours a week of door knocking. Um, I do maybe three hours a week of, of cold calling. That's not my preferred method. But I try to do 35 to 50 open houses a year. And the combination of, of my deciding that there's a more determined buyer at an open house, even though the quantity might be less, the quality is higher. And my experience, my overall knowledge of the industry, and my personality lend itself better. I'm not a very aggressive used car salesman type personality. Um, and, I, and I present that as such. And so for me, that works. So when you look at, you know, obviously you're doing all the things that, you know, obviously would work also similarly in the mortgage world, but I want you to talk about, so you've done all this, and, uh, you know, what type of originator, when you talked about it before, what was it that you were looking at an originator, and what makes sense for those on the webinar today to really make part of their core presentation? I think, I think when you're talking about how do I get a real estate agent, the best thing I can tell you is I said initially, you know, you're looking for someone who can help you and, and, and get set up or take you in the direction of your, of your business. Beyond that, I think what it is, you're going to talk to two or three and do a deal with one or two or three. Then it becomes a matter of performance and communication. Like I said, I do 90% of my business with a non-preferred lender. But that lender, when that lender tells me a loan's going to close, that loan's going to close. When that lender tells me, when we discuss a borrower up front and when we talk prior to a prequal, that, that lender is going to talk to the customer the same way they talk to me. It's not... They're not selling as much as they are consulting. It's a very consultative selling environment for both the real estate agent and for the loan officer. 
And that's what brought me to that lender. It's, you know, yes, certainly you have to have, you know, a quiver full of products. But to come and tell me that we can go down to 580 credit score doesn't impress me. To get a loan to closing impresses me. And to communicate effectively with the borrower and with the real estate agent during that process and the title company, I, I point out. So basically what it boils down to is, I, I think the number one skill is communication. I think that's far and away the most important. Obviously, we're all selling ourselves, so that communicative uh, talent is, is number one. It's, again, you have to have the, the weapons in your arsenal, but you have to be able to communicate to everybody effectively. You know, somebody with a foreclosure, you know, you don't throw your hands up and go, oh, my God. You know, you, you look at it and analyze at the beginning whether or not you're going to make it work. Um, and, and that's the key. The key is communication. And as you said earlier, you know, it's to not over-promise and under-deliver. It's to under-promise and over-deliver. And, and that same sentiment to title, borrower, real estate agent. So, Pat, when you look at the communication side, so we can kind of nail down to how often and, and what it should be, in your experience with your own accounts and then obviously with your other real estate agents that you work with, how often do you think that real estate agents actually want to be uh, contacted? In my case, I, I want to be contacted every Every time there is a step, in other words, um, okay, Pat, I, I've requested all their information. And this doesn't have to be a phone call necessarily. I accept it as, a, as an email, you know, where I'm, even if I'm just copied on an email to the borrowers requesting information. Uh, if there is a delay, I expect to know about it right away. Two of us, the agent and the lender, pressing a borrower for documents is much more effective. Mm -hmm. So every time there is a step, now once a loan is submitted to underwriting, I don't have to hear anything until it comes out of underwriting. You know, when the appraisal is ordered, when the appraisal comes back. So it's, I would say on average in one of my deals, my, my preferred lender, we probably communicate minimally once a week on every deal mm -hmm. and certainly every step. Mm -hmm. Do you want the originator to come to closing? No. We, we have a different, it's a different situation in Arizona. Okay. okay it's a deed of trust state. Oh, all right. Okay. State. So, so there is no closing table. Right. We don't have here what we had in the East. The, the, I have, in the houses I've bought and sold myself, I have never met the seller or a buyer. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, right. And don't transfer until the 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 title is, and the deed are recorded. Sure. So the buyers or the sellers might sign on a Friday uh, at the title office or through courier or or mm -hmm. FedEx. The, then the the buyers might do Monday. The funding might take place Tuesday and. I get a phone call from title that it's recorded, and then I go meet the buyers and give them their keys. Okay. Well, what so about it's a process? Yeah, it's right. Uh, what about the issue from your viewpoint of looking at this? Um, does a real estate agent really kind of care about the lender, or do they care about who their originator is? A good agent, yes. A good agent would care because it, it's really a partnership. I mean, I don't care who the real estate agent is. If, if your lender isn't good, you're not closing. And if you're not closing, you're going to get a reputation of because you're their primary source, the, the borrower or the buyer's primary source or the seller. So if, if things go south, you're the first level of complaint. And your reputation is at stake. So yes, I think very much so. The the real estate agent cares about the lender. 
By the same token, I think a real estate agent should, should and probably does, I know I did, does the lender really care about me? Or is it just a financial transaction? And that's how I wound up with, with my preferred lender. It, it's truly a partnership. Um, we're in communication all the time. And yeah, I think it goes beyond, I think it's more important today than it ever was. It goes well beyond the old relationship of LO and agent. I think today it's, um, you, you develop a personal relationship. Uh, I won't necessarily say you become buddies or friends, but you become closer to friends than business people, than just a straight business relationship. Pat, talk about, and certainly I see many loan officers talking about, because it's a, you know, there's a marketing service agreement in place, um, and I think that's the case also at your broker. But really, the, the, that agent can line up with someone else, and that's obviously what you've done. Um, I think a lot of originators kind of use that as an excuse for poor production, when the truth of the matter is what you've done is you've developed your own relationship. Kind of talk about that. Yeah, you know, the, the MSA is a funny thing. First of all, <laughs> From, from when I first got here, you know, my initial reaction to all of that was to cringe because as a lender, I didn't always want right. the real estate company's handout. Uh, so that was my first blush. But what it, it's, it's really meaningless to the individual agent. In fact, uh, sometimes it's, you know, there are some agents in my office who won't deal with the preferred just because they think that's, you know, a conflict. But, but if you think that's stymieing your business, that's only an excuse. Actually, first of all, our preferred vendors, the people that, that our company does, they've all been vetted, and they are all very, very, very good vendors. Uh, in my case, I do use a, a preferred vendor for home inspections uh, because I like, and I, I tried several, the one I use, and, and some not, some preferred. The one I use um, does a terrific job, communicates well with the customer, and so forth. So MSA is a funny thing. But what it does do for an, a, a lender is it does get you some visibility. But by the same token, there are some vendors who present to a team that are not necessarily preferred vendors of the company. For instance, the lender I use does present to the team that I participate in, but are not a preferred vendor of the company. They never address the company meeting. Mm -hmm. so, so certainly the MSA relationship gets you in front of agents easier, but it is not a hindrance at all. Every agent in my company can choose whomever they want to deal business with. So from your viewpoint, when you look at it, um, and you talked about a team, uh, talk a little bit about or explain what a team means from your viewpoint. You obviously have lined up with other agents, right? Is that what you're doing? Yes. Right. Actually, the, the team I'm on, um, and, and our brokerage has probably 10 teams, um, which, which only comprise, oh my, my God, I would... I would venture to say the total of those 10 teams is not even 10% of the number of agents in the company. So okay. you, you, you certainly don't have to be on. I'm on a team of 20 agents. Uh, we meet once a week um, and we share information. We share um, uh, experiences. And we do have vendors come in and present to us you know, it might only be 10 minutes, uh, but that is another way of visibility that, and I don't want to use this, the word circumvent MSAs, but it's a way to get to present to a group of agents without having to be in an MSA relationship with any specific brokerage. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, the team itself becomes a sales point for an LO who performs, because we talk about that. Teams talk about all their experiences, which lenders are no good, which lenders are great, 
which lenders are so-so. The same with every other type of vendor. So a team not only helps each other as an agent in, in, in understanding experiences in the field and understanding circumstances and different contract arrangements, but it's also a good opportunity for an LO to get in front of a team. Now, you might not want to knock yourself out in a team with two or three people, but there are lots of teams that are eight, nine, ten, or more people, and that's a good opportunity to get visibility. And typically, team members perform at a, at a fairly decent level. Uh, my team this year, everybody averaged at least a deal a month. So if you think of 20 people, you're talking 240 deals for the year. Um, I think our team did 20, for the sake of argument, $23 million of business. So, you know, if you could call on that team and get into, you know, half of that or a quarter of that, you'd be picking up $5 million worth of business without having to be involved at the brokerage level as, a, as an MSA level. Right. Right. So uh, explain a little bit, in other words, from an originator standpoint, so they see, you know, your broker, and how do they find the teams? I mean, how do you get this type of information, and, and who's on the teams? What, what would be practical tips that an LO would do? Well, there are, there are two things. One, social media. Uh, you know, you, you could, if you go on social media, you'll see some of them have, you'll see there are teams posted. In other words, some people present themselves as a member of a team. I do not on my social media, but, but some people do. Another way is to just talk to agents. Right. And, and you'll find out if they're on a team. Ask them how many people are on their team, how their teams operate. Um, could you get the opportunity to present? And... Quite often you could do that. Now, I'm not saying a team is, is, is too very different, but, you know, I mean, you get some small vendors who come in and for, for the, the price of two dozen donuts, you know, get to present their, their case before, you know, 20 agents who are, are pretty good producers. So, I mean, that's an opportunity. But you find out about that, A, by talking to agents, B, social media, like anything else. You have to do some homework. Right. How often, Pat, are you on social media? Now, I know you for a very long time, and I'm interested to hear kind of what your social media strategy is. Yeah, and, and remember, now I'm an old-timer. <laughs> oh, no, but young at heart. <laughs> I'm on every day. You're every day, okay. I'm on Facebook every day. I have, um, I have a business Facebook page. You know, Pat Pateritz Real Estate. Um, uh, you know, as a fan page of of, of Facebook, um, I, I have a Twitter and an Instagram. Although I don't use those quite as much, uh, I put all I do all of my listings. I will post, and I don't leave them out there forever. I I, I do all my open houses, both on on my. Um, Facebook page as well as on Craigslist. So uh, one thing I do know, and, and even as an old timer, and that is social media is a place. And you can go on, if you're on social media, you know, obviously, you know, you make a friend request to Pateritz or, or, or to whoever is in your marketplace. And not every agent is going to necessarily say yes. But, um, and, and I, have, I have somebody in the office who helped me connect LinkedIn to Instagram, and so if I take a picture and post it on Instagram, it'll go on LinkedIn and, and my web page. I also put, uh, uh, pardon me, and my Facebook page. I also do community things on my Facebook page. You know, I'll post something like the other day, Sky Harbor got recognized as the airport, the number one airport in the country by TSA. So, you know, you post that on there and show that you're part of the community. Um, but I'm on every day. Yeah, and, and I guess that's your preferred group is Facebook versus the LinkedIn side of it. Is that right? Yes. Right. Now, that is because 
I, I don't know if there's any particular reason other than that's just the way I went. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Has it worked for you? In other words, you've been doing it now every day for a while. So what, what's your kind of read on it? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I get some good feedback. I've had people uh, come to open houses. Uh, mm -hmm. that they, they, in fact, a couple people brought in a printout from Craigslist. And people say, oh, yeah, we saw the open house on Facebook and we decided to come by. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it is any kind of, for me, it has not been any kind of a shortcut. Um, you, it's a way of keeping yourself in communication with people you've already identified as a lead. Right. It's not going to generate leads. Now, once in a while, you know, I'm, I'm listed, I mean, I'm on Zillow and, and Trulia and all that stuff. Um, you, you get very, very little uh, from them, like a value. If you said, 80, as you said earlier, 88% of people deal with an agent, and even if they go through and shop, and, and a vast majority go through and shop online, but still want to deal with an agent. You know, the, the, the deals are more complex today, and, you know, with disclosures and so many things for, for an unsuspecting buyer or seller to be aware of, that, and that's the reason for agents. So, but, Pat, if you had to leave, I guess, the audience today with to be successful on the origination side, developing the referral sources in 2015, what would be your top two kind of suggestions? Target, number one, find, find the agents that you want to deal with. Find out the ones that are full-time. Find out the ones that are, and, and full-time, by that I mean, they don't have another job. This is their primary source of income, or in my case, primary source of, of activity. Um, and number two, two, persistent, consistent, and communicate. You know, stay with it. I'm not saying be pushy. I'm saying be there. Be supportive. Be informational. Be communicative. And those are the two biggest things. You know, there, there are, like you said earlier, there are a gazillion real estate agents in the marketplace. Um, only 10% are full-time. That's an important element. Um, and, and like I said, pay attention to the schools. Find out where the schools are, uh, the real estate, you know, licensing places. Find out where people go. Um, some of the, when I went to school, there were probably three or four lenders placards up and business cards there because they'll sponsor things, um, you know, cookies or something, you know, stupid stuff, or come in sometimes and be a guest speaker on the financial part of the school. Um, that's a good way to find out who's coming out of school, find out where they're going. And you could tell, you know, probably in – in two to three months of a new student graduate, you could probably tell if they're going to make it or not. At least you could tell if you're going to make it or not. If you're if you're an LO and you're going to be successful, you'll be able to spot the uh, the agents that are going to be su successful as well. Well, they're all great points, and I think they're all very tactical, and especially the point regarding that the individual agent, and that's certainly what the data is showing, even when there is an MSA, you know, the individual agent plus the team component, you know, does drive who they interact with, and I think that's a great point to make and reemphasize for everyone today. Thanks, Pat. I certainly appreciate it. You've been wonderful as usual. And I want to give, I know Pat likes to do Facebook, but certainly uh, LinkedIn with him. He'd sure love to hear you, hear from you. And uh, if you're going into Scottsdale, certainly he loves to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> anywhere, anywhere, Scottsdale, Tempe, or Chandler, or Gilbert, that's my market. Um, and even if you just have questions, even if you want to know what's a good golf course, feel free. Yeah, yeah, he's actually a very good golfer. I'll have to warn everybody beforehand. So anyway, well, thanks, Pat. You've been wonderful. And really, Thank I you. think it's, the, Thanks, information, yeah, the information has been terrific.